I'm Ted Voltmer, one of the pastors here at the chapel. And whether this is your first time with us or you've been here for years, I'm glad you're here today. We think the chapel is a special place and hopefully after today you will too. So join us for some worship and enjoy the message. Well, good morning and welcome to the classic service. We're glad that you are here, whether you're here in person or whether you're, you're here online. We welcome you, and we're just glad that you're here to worship and praise the Lord together. I uh, was reminded of a verse this week, um, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, and the glory of God. And it just, it just reminded me that the, I, the musician in me jumped to the ear has not heard. And I thought to myself, the greatest music I've ever heard, I still haven't heard. How exciting is that? And so as we are very happy to have our orchestra back with us and we heard some really nice comments, it's only a little bit of what glory is going to be. So let's stand together and praise the Lord together with music and glory and honor to our Lord. you 
together. Father, we thank you that there is none like you. Father, we worship you this morning. We thank you for the privilege that we have to be here, to be online, to see this, and to worship with this community. We thank you so much, Lord, for who you are, for what you have done for us, and for the privilege and honor we have to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray this, Lord, now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Sing with us. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his Love. 
Well, good morning. Welcome to the chapel. It's great to see everyone here today. Welcome to everyone joining us online. Thank you for tuning in this morning. We're happy that you're here. If this is your first time here, or maybe your first time in a long time, welcome back, or welcome. Uh, It's great to be worshiping with you today. We're so thankful um, just to be able to be here together, be here online as we continue just to learn and, and see what God has for us and draw closer in our relationship to God and our relationship to each other. So it's a great thing that we're here this morning together. I want to continue uh, just to thank everyone who gives so generously to our church. It makes a huge difference, not only in the lives of the people around us, but it also makes a big difference in the life of the giver. God is so generous to us, and we just have the generosity flow through us. And uh, it's part of our discipleship process, reading his word, praying, spending time with him, serving each other, and giving financially. That's part of the whole uh, discipleship package. And um, it's an act of worship, and you guys are worshiping well. So we thank you for that. It makes a difference all around the world, and we're appreciative of that. We're continuing our sermon series today. Pastor Dave is going to be up in just a minute talking about anxiety. Anyone, could that relate? Anyone might be able to connect with that a little bit? Yeah, um, that's going to be good. So we're going, to, we're going to hear from him in just a minute. But one more thing. One more slight little announcement that I want to share with you guys today. Today's a very special day in the life of our church. There's a staff member whose birthday is today. You may know him. His name is Pastor Dave. Yeah. <laughs> so he is, he is uh, I, I think I can speak for all of us when I say, Dave, happy birthday. Thank you for your friendship, for your leadership, and how you serve everyone so well. We're just so appreciative to have you. So happy birthday. Hope your day is special. And uh, can we just say happy birthday to Dave on the count of three? One, two, three. Happy birthday, Pastor. <laughs> all right. Let's, let's pray. God, thank you for our church. Thank you for this family that's gathered here today. Thanks for Dave and, and just all he means to so much of us. Help him to have a great birthday. God, thank you that we get to be a part of what you're doing, just not only here in our church and in our own personal lives, but just really all over the place, God. Um, thank you for your just grace and your truth and your generosity that you pour out to us. And um, uh, I just pray for all of us that we can, we, when we receive that, it, we just take it and then it just flows through us, God. So um, we thank you that giving is not something that you demand of us, but that you ask of us. Um, because it's based on your nature and who you are. And um, we thank you for that opportunity. So we pray uh, for that this morning. We thank you for the message that's going to that's gonna speak to us today, talking about anxiety and what, what's a better way than that. Um, so I thank you that that message is going to hit home to so many people. And um, we thank you that your word is living and active and true. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hi everyone, I'm Samantha and welcome to the chapel. As you know, here at the chapel, families are very important to us. So we're planning a family dedication service on June 13th during our Sunday services. If you're committed to raising your son or daughter in a Christ-centered home, then you should attend our class on May 19th via Zoom. You can email heather at thechapel.org for more information and to register. If you're a married couple, then you know communication is one of the single most important aspects of your marriage. It can make or break your relationship and every couple can use some help with it. And that's why we're bringing you Fighting Fair small group led by our Associate Director of Care, John Diaz. It starts on Monday, May 24th at 7.30 p.m. via Zoom. So if you have questions about the group or want to sign up, make sure to email jdiaz at thechapel.org. Just a reminder to sign up for the chapel's virtual 5K fun run coming up at the end of this month. You can head over to the events page of our website to find out more information and to sign up. You can also purchase your 5K t-shirt there and a portion of every sale will be going towards our community garden. So make sure to head over to the events page of our website after service. Thanks again for joining us today for more information and events. Make sure to check out our website, thechapel.org or follow us on social media.
Well, good morning, Chapel family. Morning. Great to see everybody today. Thank you for the birthday wishes. Feeling very blessed. Um, also just uh, feeling the weight of some of the things that are happening in our world this morning. So I just wanted to start us with, uh, with a prayer, especially for what's happening in Israel and the, and the Middle East. So let me just lead us. Lord, today we gather in this really peaceful place, relatively speaking, on a beautiful day. And um, we want to put ourselves in the shoes for a minute of folks that are living in, uh, in Israel with, with rockets flying overhead, or people living in Gaza with, with bombs falling. And God, we just cry out to you for peace. We pray that in place of uh, anger and and vengeance and, and hatred, Lord, that you would bring uh, forgiveness, that you would bring grace and, and kindness. And Lord, we know that's a big, big ask, but we just ask you for that this morning in the power of Christ, Lord, that you, that you will bring peace into our world. Um, <clears throat> and Lord, I, on a much, on a much uh, closer to home level, I pray that you will bring peace uh, in, in our country with all the division that's, that's among us, and I pray that you would bring peace in our homes and in our hearts. Um, Lord, show us this morning through your holy word uh, what peace in our hearts really looks like and, and re- where it really comes from. God, we just commit this service to you and pray for your blessing on it now. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I did want to mention also um, one little way that the chapel is working to, to bring peace in, in our country to some of the racial division that uh, we have experienced in heightened amounts over the last last few years. Uh, We are leading a small group called Be the Bridge, which is really built on the premise that the gospel of Christ is the power that can help really uh, build bridges between people who feel so separated. And so, uh, really important small group, and I just wanted to let you know about it. It meets on Thursday evenings. It's one of the groups that's meeting outside now that the weather is nice. So Thursday evenings at 6.30 right here on the chapel campus in Lincoln Park. Um, if you are interested in being part of that group, uh, you can find it on our website. You can also just email smallgroups@thechapel.org and say, hey, tell me about that, that Be the Bridge group, and uh, they'll, they'll tell you more about it. So just really recommend that if you want to learn more about how you can be part of the solution. All right, so we're taking this spring to walk through Paul's letter to the Philippians, which was written by Paul when he was sitting in a Roman prison. So if you were to have looked at him from the outside, you would have said, here's a guy with zero freedom. But it doesn't take long in reading the letter to realize that Paul was actually a very free man. There's just this this spaciousness and and fierce freedom to his soul that comes out as he writes the book. And so what that tells us right off the bat is whatever prisons we might be experiencing in our lives, whether the prison of of physical sickness that seems to trap us or um, relational kinds of prisons or maybe a prison of debt in your life, that no matter what those outer things are, there is this inner freedom, this most important kind of freedom that's always available to us. So it's really a life-changing concept if we can internalize that. So today, Paul's going to show us that no matter what's going on around us, we are free to have peace. What a, a priceless thing to have inner peace, isn't it? And just so we're clear on, on what this means, there's a verse in this passage that defines what the opposite of peace is. So in Philippians 4, 6, it says, do not be anxious about anything. So I would say the opposite of peace is anxiety. So what is anxiety? Let me give you a simple dictionary definition. Anxiety is a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. So that's what it means to have anxiety, a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease. Anybody felt any of that over the last, oh, 14 months or so? I mean, this is just a part of our world. I was recently talking with a friend who's a licensed therapist, and she said the biggest kind of life issue that she's seeing people um, need help with is that there's so much uncertainty in the world, more than usual. There are more things that we just don't know how they're gonna play out, and all of that uncertainty is creating this heightened anxiety in us. So, 
feeling worry, nervousness, or unease. The pandemic has given us all kinds of reasons to be anxious, but also let's not blame everything on the pandemic, right? Sometimes it's an easy scapegoat. Way before the pandemic, the level of anxiety in American culture was rising. Just one example, back in 2016, Time Magazine ran an article entitled Teen Depression and Anxiety, Why the Kids Are Not All Right. One teenager who was interviewed said, we are the first generation that cannot escape our problems at all. We're all like little volcanoes. We're getting this constant pressure from our phones, from our relationships, from the way things are today. It's really sad, isn't it? And everybody knows it's not just teenagers. If you are having a hard time sleeping, it's likely because of anxiety. If you're finding yourself drinking more than you used to, and we've all heard the statistics, right, about alcohol sales skyrocketing over the last year or so, it's probably because of anxiety. If you find yourself getting angry more often at all these idiots who don't see things the right way like you do, um, that's a result of anxiety. Anxiety is a big deal. Did you know this, that if you read um, on a Kindle, you know, an e-reader e Kindle device, that Amazon keeps track of your highlights if you highlight while you read? It's kind of creepy, I know. But this is actually really interesting. Amazon just released what the most highlighted part of the Bible is for people who read the Bible on a Kindle. What do you think the most highlighted passage is? I would have thought maybe like John 3.16, maybe um, the 23rd Psalm, right? The Lord is my shepherd. Maybe, uh, maybe the Lord's Prayer. None of those. You know what the most highlighted passage in the Bible is on a Kindle? Philippians 4, 6 and 7, which is right at the heart of the passage we're going to talk about today, and it's a passage all about anxiety and peace. Isn't that, isn't that revealing? People see that. Of all the things, they go, oh yeah, i got to remember this verse. It's a massive need in the world today, and I have a feeling it's a real need in your life also. So let's read the passage, Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. I invite you all now to hear the word of God. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. So I'm feeling... Feeling a little crazy today, Maybe it must be a birthday thing, so instead of my normal three points, I'm going with five. <laughs> you heard me right, five points. And actually, <clears throat> th these come from the five commands that you find in this short passage. So if you think about it, anytime there's a command in Scripture, that means we have a choice whether we're going to follow that command or not, right? Um, otherwise, you know, why, why would there be a command there? But that's really important in this case because sometimes when anxiety is rising in our lives, we feel like we're passive victims of the circumstances, right? Like life is just happening to us. We don't get to choose anything. We're, we're powerless, but it's not true. The most important choices in life are always open to you. Nothing can take those, those choices away. So this, this short passage gives us five choices we can make in the face of anxiety. So here's the first one. Choose joy. Choose joy. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Almost seems weird to command someone to be joyful, doesn't it? Like, you will be happy now. On the count of three, you will smile. One, two... But the only reason that seems strange is because we're so used to, used to thinking of joy as a feeling that happens to us, right? And so you can't command someone to feel a certain way. But joy is not primarily a feeling. And I think also we're so used to thinking that joy comes as a result of things going well in our lives. 
Uh, but that's not how the Bible sees it at all. The Apostle Paul was a joyful person because he had learned to anchor his joy in something that never changes. His outer circumstances were chaos. They changed all the time. So he found something that didn't change, and he, he planted his joy in that. A few years ago, Rick Warren, the pastor and the, the author of, of you know, uh, Purpose Driven Life and other things, experienced a horrific tragedy. His 27-year-old son committed suicide. I cannot think of an event in life that would cause more angst and grief and sadness and anxiety than that. So uh, at Thanksgiving that year, Time Magazine asked several public figures what they're thankful for, and I just want to read you what Rick Warren said. This year became the worst year of my life when my youngest son, who'd struggled since childhood with mental illness, took his own life. How am I supposed to be thankful? God doesn't expect me to be thankful for all circumstances, but rather in all circumstances. There's a huge difference. The first attitude is masochism. The second shows maturity. I'm thankful that God sees all I go through. He cares. He grieves with me. I'm thankful that even though I don't have all the answers, God does. I'm thankful that God can bring good, about, uh, can bring good even out of the bad in my life when I give him the pieces. It's his specialty. God loves to turn crucifixions into resurrections and then benefit the whole world. I don't have to tell you guys that life can be brutal sometimes. And so if you anchor your joy in, in circumstances, it, in, in saying, okay, my job is going pretty well, um, nobody's fighting in my family at least today, I don't have a migraine today, all right, all right, I can be joy. If that's the way you do it, you're just setting yourself up for, for disaster, for a collapse. But if you learn to root your joy in God, it's kind of like drilling down deep into the earth and finding well water that comes up. And then on the surface, even if there's drought and chaos, that, that water of life just keeps on giving. There's a steadiness and a reliability to it doesn't mean you're always laughing and joking. That's not the way joy is. I mean, you, can be, you know, you can be joyful through tears. You can be joyful through grieving, but that's real joy. That's why I so appreciate the example of people like Rick Warren, actually very similar to the example of, of Tony Dungy, the former NFL coach. His teenage son took his own life when he was just a teenager. Um, and it's similar to other stories of people that are much closer to home. Um, they grieved they mourned, they showed healthy emotions, they stepped away from their work for a while, um, and of course it was devastating, but the anxiety didn't eat them alive because there was something deeper than what was happening in their lives that was anchoring them. Um, and by God's grace, we get to choose that kind of joy. Here's the second choice we can make. Choose gentleness. Choose gentleness. Verse 5 says, let your gentleness be evident to all. That word for gentleness was a word that was normally used when you would expect somebody to strike back or seek revenge because they've been wrongly treated. But instead, they respond with restraint. So it's a, it's a very surprising kind of response. Gentleness when you would expect angry aggression. Um, you're merging from Route 3 West onto Route 46 West. And you've been patiently going along in your lane, taking your turn, and then you see out of your right side view mirror a car racing along the shoulder who then decides to cut in right in front of you. But instead of leaning on the horn and saying things that you'll probably have to ask God's forgiveness for later, you just kind of back off and let it go. And you say to yourself, you know, maybe his girlfriend just broke up with him or maybe something worse just happened in his life. Um, you post something on social media that's very important to your heart. And shortly thereafter, someone that you know posts a response strongly disagreeing with you and, 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 and kind of challenging you. As you read their response, you feel the adrenaline build. You feel your heart rate picking up. But instead of jumping into the battle to set them straight, you just close your laptop. You put away your phone. You say, God, what are you trying to show me through this? Let your gentleness be evident to all. And the only way you can really do that well is if you know the second half of that verse. The Lord is near. 
Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Jesus modeled this incredibly. Look at 2 Peter 2.23. When they hurled their insults at him, that's hard to be gentle when people are hurling insults at you, right? He did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. So what did he do? Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So Jesus was able to respond with gentleness and self-control. How? Because he knew that God could handle it. He had a very close recognition of God's near presence. He didn't have to take matters into his own hands because he knew that God was in control. So when I get all stressed out and I want to go at it with someone, I have to ask myself, do I believe the Lord is near? Do I believe that God's got control of this? Because if I do, um, it, it, it leads toward gentleness. When we believe the Lord is near, it develops, I would call it a powerful gentleness. It's a weakness to have to jump in and, and, and get into the fight anytime someone provokes you. It's power, it's strength to restrain yourself. Here's the third choice. Choose prayer. Choose prayer. Verse 6 is, is the first half of that passage, that, the most popular Kindle passage. So here's what it says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Uh, this one verse, Philippians 4, 6, is like a mini course in prayer. There's so much in there. So let me just call out three big things we learn about prayer. First, we learn to pray always. Always. It says in every situation. Listen, there is not a situation in life where it's not the right thing to do to pray. They're not a single situation. If you think about it, this is how good relationships work, right? They, they work by communication. I'm later this month, this is a big month for me, later this month I celebrate 32 years of marriage with my lovely bride. And when I spend time with other couples that have been together and have good relationships, I see communication happening. They find time to get on the phone with each other. We find time to text. If you saw the text history between Norma Jean and me, you would think sometimes we're still teenagers. We don't let more than a half a day or so go by without checking in with each other. Couples that are strong find time to have coffee together. They, they, they get away together and talk about things. Strong couples communicate all the time. And strong Christians pray all the time. Um, it's just part of how relationships work. Maybe you think, I, I just disagree. God has bigger things to do. God's working in the Middle East to try to bring peace. He doesn't have time for my stuff. Uh, it's just wrong. Jesus said, your father knows the number of hairs on your head. He cares about every single detail. God, whatever it is that's on your mind right now that you're doing this afternoon, God's into that. God cares about that. He cares about your financial stuff, cares about the fears of the phobias you have. He cares about your love life or lack thereof. He cares about your physical aches and pains, your family problems. He cares about all of those things. Um, so talk to him about that. Because every time you pray about whatever in your life, you're reminding yourself, there's somebody way bigger than you who cares about your deal, and he's in this with you. It's honestly hard for anxiety to compete with that kind of knowledge. This verse also teaches us to pray specifically, because it says, present your requests to God, not pray for a general blessing over your life. Present your individual itemized requests directly to God. The specific things that you think about while you lie in bed struggling to get to sleep at night. That's the stuff you should talk to God about in detail. I find myself more and more as I get older, as I'm driving, I find myself more and more turning off the music. Because here's what I catch myself doing. I'm going along in the car and there's music playing and inevitably my mind drifts toward the problems in my life. Anybody else? Like, I don't naturally think of my blessings. <laughs> I naturally think of what's wrong and, and the people problems I'm having and how I have to solve it. I'm thinking about those things. So more and more, I find myself turning off the podcast, turning off the music, and just instead of just thinking about that stuff, talking to God specifically. Lord, here's why I'm feeling uncomfortable about this situation. Here's why I'm, I'm, I'm dreading my confrontation with this person. Lord, help me with this. Lord, help 
him to be self-controlled today as he faces this temptation in his life. Lord, give her a, a, a breakthrough of emotional peace. Whatever things are on my mind, lay those things out specifically to God. He wants to hear them in detail. God has all the time in the world. He loves hearing from you. And then third, pray gratefully. Pray gratefully. Notice it doesn't say, okay, when you pray for something, and then when God gives you what you ask for, make sure you say thank you for that. It doesn't say that. It says, when you're presenting your requests, do it with thanksgiving. Before you get any kind of answer, be thankful. Well, why would, why would you do that? And how would you do that? Well, only if you're convinced that God knows way more than you do and that he'll always do what's right. Um, Tim Keller said, God will either give us what we ask or give us what we would have asked if we knew everything he knows. I love that. So if I believe that, that God is infinitely wiser than I am, that, then, and that he loves me, that not only that he's wise, but that he's got my good, then even as I pray for something I think I need, I can be thankful even before I know exactly what the answer is going to be. I think of some of the big things that I prayed for over the years. I prayed for success in my pre-med studies. That success never came because God had a different calling for me. I, I, I think of, I prayed that, you know, certain girls that I wanted to date while I was in college would say yes to me. And those yeses never came because God had someone different in mind for me. I, there were certain injuries that I prayed would heal quickly and they healed really slow. Some of them still haven't healed because God was teaching me patience and compassion for other suffering people and, and, and other deeper things. And so, yeah, I prayed for things, but the more I'm convinced that God's going to answer according to what's good for me, then even before I see an answer, I can be thankful right off the bat. Um, I'm, I'm growing in that. I'm, I'm working on that. So when you feel anxiety rising up, choose to pray. Pray, pray always, pray specifically, and pray thankfully. There's literally no prison in life that can stop you from praying. Think about that freedom that you have. Fourth choice we can make, choose beauty. Choose beauty. Verse eight, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is, ready? True, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, that's the kind of thing you should think about. So you have the power to decide what kinds of things are gonna fill your mind. And so Paul says, look, decide to dwell on things that are noble and right and pure and lovely. And the word that I'm using to kind of wrap up all those adjectives is the word beauty. Choose to fill your mind with beautiful things. I recently mentioned a, a Japanese-American artist named Makoto Fujimura. When he and his wife were newly married, they moved up to Connecticut because his wife was pursuing a master's degree. And Makoto was teaching in a special education school. He was also trying to work on his art, his painting, in, in their apartment. So they had a really tight budget. He said they had to live on a lot of cans of tuna every week to make it through the week. Um, they just didn't have much money. And he, he talked about one evening, he was sitting alone at home, um, thinking about how they were going to put food on the table the next week. Um, the bank account was basically empty. And his wife walked through the door holding a bouquet of flowers. And he said, I got angry. And I said to her, how can you buy flowers when we can't even afford to eat? And he said his wife's reply has been burned into his heart for more than 30 years. His wife said to him, you know, we need to feed our souls too. You guys, we need to feed our souls. And so choose to feed them. You can choose to feed them either worthless things, um, or you could feed them beautiful things. If you drive around all day listening to political talk radio, is it any wonder that you feel angry and aggressive all the time? If you spend hours a day on social media comparing your life with everybody else's body and home and kids and vacations, um, can't you see that's what brings anxiety up in your life? Choose what to fill yourself with. You have, you have that authority. You're in charge of that. 
a, a few months ago, actually a few weeks ago, Norma Jean and I had a, an evening free and we wanted to watch something on TV. So we were trying to decide what should we watch. You ever notice there's like a million things to watch on TV and there's also like nothing to watch on TV? So we were looking at these options and I found this show on Amazon Prime called Mully. I'd never heard of it before. It was about this guy named Charles Mully who grew up in Kenya. Um, his family abandoned him when he was a little kid. They were so desperate they moved without telling him. And so he made his way to Nairobi, to the capital. He found work. Through his employer, he discovered the gospel and gave his life to Christ. Through this amazing series of events, he got another job and then started a business, a, a taxi company, and he became fabulously rich. He just had this knack for entrepreneurship. And he became so wealthy that he decided all this was given to me for a reason, and he began to open up orphanages all over Kenya, amazingly joyful places for kids to live. It's, it's been this, become this phenomenon all across Kenya. So we watched this, this movie, and we walked away from it feeling like our souls were a little bit bigger. Like, that was beautiful. There are other times that we watch things on TV, and afterwards we look at each other and we go, why did we watch that? You ever have that feeling? Like, I think my soul just shriveled a little bit from watching that. We need to fill our souls with beautiful things. Beauty, listen, beauty is so much stronger than anxiety. It overpowers it. And then one more choice we can make is to choose action. Choose action. Verse 9, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. When you feel anxiety coming on, one of the wisest things that you can do is to put into practice things that you know are right. In other words, don't just sit there and be a passive victim of anxiety. Take some action. You have that autonomy as a, as a, as a, a human being. In my early years at the chapel, I was so privileged to mentor somewhat under Pastor Marsh Davis. Some of you guys remember Marsh was our pastor of care for years. And I remember Marsh telling me, when I work with people who are struggling with depression, he said, I always tell them to fight the tendency to just sit or to sleep too much uh, because that tends to breed more depression. And so he would tell them to do something constructive. Just make yourself get up, clean out the garage, clean out the junk drawer, clean out the fridge, um, call someone on the phone, go to the gym and work out. I was just speaking to someone this morning who's recently lost their spouse. And this person said to me, they're here in person in church, this person said to me, you know what, I kind of made myself get up and come this morning. I chose to do what I know is right. I so appreciated that. Of course, that's not the whole solution to depression, but it's an act of obedience to God. It gets you moving in a good direction. So if you're feeling anxiety right now for, for any reason, Maybe God's wisdom for you is as simple as taking action, putting into practice the things you know are good and healthy and honoring to God. Sometimes that'll feel like an act of sheer obedience. You won't have the energy for it. You won't have the desire to do it, but you choose because you can, because God has given you that freedom. So choose joy. Choose gentleness when it's so easy to strike back. Choose prayer, choose to fill yourself with beauty, and choose to take action. And if we make those five choices, the anxiety in our lives will just instantly melt away, right? Nope, probably not, actually. You know why? Because the Bible's not a self-help book. It's not a manual of follow these steps and you will get this result. It's not a, it's not a, a formula. Um, in fact, if you follow, if you go home today and say, okay, Pastor Dave told us these five things to do, I'm going to do those, and you follow those to a T, you might still be pretty stressed out. You know why that is? Because ultimately, peace is not a psychological state that you can, you can conjure up in yourself. Ultimately, peace comes from a relationship with, with a personal God. Peace, peace is not a ritual, it, it's a relationship at the end of the day. It's a person. So making those five choices is wisdom, but as you're making those choices, realize that you're not creating peace, but you are opening yourself up to the one 
who can bring you peace. To me, the greatest analogy is, is if you've ever done any sailing, you can get out on the water and you can raise your sails and you can position your sails and make sure your rigging is right and everything is in the right place, but you're not going to go anywhere unless there's some what? Unless there's some wind, right? I mean, the wind is really what brings the movement to, to the sailboat. And side note, I think it's just so cool that the Greek word for wind, pneuma, is the same Greek word for spirit, pneuma, because there's this wind-like power and unpredictability to, this, to the spirit of God. But when you do all these five steps, it's like raising your sails. It's like saying, okay, God, I want to put myself in the, position, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the path of your power. I want to position myself so I can receive your peace, because unless he shows up, um, there's no real peace. Verse 7 has this awesome promise, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God is a peace that you only get from a relationship with God. And then verse 9, I love how it says it a little bit differently, and the God of peace will be with you. That's even better, right? God doesn't just give you his peace. He gives you himself. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, as he sat in a German prison for daring to defy Adolf Hitler, wrote this little poem. This is the beginning of the poem. He said, in me there's darkness, but with you there is light. I am lonely, but you do not leave me. I'm feeble in heart, but with you there is help. I'm restless, but with you there is peace. The level of stress that he was under was so intense he needed more than just the peace of God. He needed to know that the God of peace himself was there with him. And it was the same for Paul. So much that was out of his control, but he knew deep in his soul that God was right there with him. And as we experience our own prisons, we need to know that. The God of peace will be with you. Peace, peace is really a person. And it's a peace that transcends all understanding. It doesn't make sense. Defies logic. It doesn't make sense that, that Rick Warren could have returned to loving his church and uh, it, leading his congregation, fighting poverty around the world, preaching the gospel after he lost his son. It transcends all understanding. It doesn't make sense that Tony Dungy is working as an NFL commentator and writing and speaking and loving his family after what happened to him. It just transcends understanding because you would think that people like that would just be ruined, right? Like, how could you even think of going on with life? They should, they should be in an alley drinking somewhere, doing drugs, other destructive things, but they're not. And the fact that they're walking in peace instead of anxiety, is testimony that our God is real. So I realize that you probably have some prisons in your life that are preventing you from doing certain things, but I'm telling you today that the most important choices in life are, are choices that are wide open to you, that you, you have the choice right now to choose joy, to choose gentleness, to choose prayer, to choose beauty, and to choose action. There, there's no prison that can take those choices away from you. So choose wisely, and the God of peace will be with you. Well, I think we need to close with communion today to really encounter the Prince of Peace. So I'm going to ask you to just take a moment to get your heart prepared. If you're here live in the room and you didn't receive a little communion kit, uh, just put your hand up and somebody will hand you one. Uh, if you're at home, I just invite you to um, make sure you have your communion supplies on hand. So there is no true peace without the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. And the reason that's true is because of what happened on the cross. So, so why is that? I mean, what's the connection between the cross 
and peace. Well, think about this. If you think about the life of Jesus as he walked this earth, he walked in perfect peace, right? I mean, there were all kinds of things around him that were, you know, potentially anxiety producing. There were angry religious leaders. There were fickle friends, all kinds of physical outward suffering and and things that could have caused anxiety. But Jesus continued to walk in perfect peace. How could he do that? Well, because he was perfectly connected with his father, right? Nothing broke that relationship between Jesus and his father. And, And so that's where he continued just to draw that peace from his father in heaven, um, until he hung on the cross. And Jesus cried out, you remember, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because for the first time in all of, of time, <laughs> the connection between God the Father and God the Son was broken. For the first time, as Jesus hung on the cross and he was bearing in his body the sins of the world, and he was receiving the perfect justice of God that our sins deserved, right? The wrath of God that our sins deserved was poured out on Jesus. And as that was happening, for the first time ever, God the Son was cut off from God the Father. For the first time ever, Jesus didn't have peace. It's a horrific moment. But for us, it's the best news imaginable because here's the reality. Because Jesus on the cross lost his peace, you and I never have to be without it. It's not an amazing arrangement, an amazing covenant God makes with us. Jesus says, I'll take what you deserve and then I'll give you what you don't deserve, and that is the peace of God. All the way back in in Isaiah, about 700 years before the time of Christ, Isaiah the prophet wrote about this, Isaiah 53, 5, but he was pierced, this is talking about Jesus, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, we are healed. Through him losing his peace, we get peace. It's truly awesome. You know, we started out the service talking about the lack of peace in this world, in the Middle East, in our country, maybe, you know, maybe in, your, your, in your kitchen this morning. And what I'm saying to you is that if we are to be peacemakers, if we are to be those blessed peacemakers that bring peace into the world, it starts in here. And the way we get it is from that cross. And so today, as you receive communion, would you just make this really personal um, to you? As you take the bread, which represents the body of Jesus, and as you take the cup, which represents his blood, Remember what he did for you, and in a fresh way, receive his peace. Say, because of this, things are good with me and my creator, and that inner peace is going to free me to go out and be a peacemaker. Let's just pray for what we're about to do. Thank you, Father, for the cross of Jesus Christ that on that cross he lost his peace with you, Father, so that we could gain it and never have to lose it. God, I, I, I feel that you want to send us out into this world as powerful peacemakers. And so I pray, Lord, that you would start that by creating a strong peace inside our hearts this morning. Lord, help us now to receive that peace through Jesus our Savior. In his name we pray, amen. Well, when Jesus was gathered with his followers at the the Last Supper, he took bread. And so I'm gonna ask us to take this little piece of bread. If you have never used these before, there's a very delicate outer layer of cellophane you have to peel back. And just grab that little wafer that's in there. And after giving thanks, Jesus broke that bread and he gave it out to his disciples, and he said, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body. So let's take and eat together. And I'll ask you to peel off that 
that second layer carefully. Because after supper, Jesus took a cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink of this cup as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. And take just a quiet moment as you feel the bread and the juice enter your body. And just whisper a little prayer, Lord, thank you for your peace. Thank you for your peace. I ask you to rise to your feet for our closing. Let's pray together. Father, as we go from this place, I know anxiety and worry will rise up probably before we even get out of the parking lot. And so, Father, would you give us the Holy Spirit wisdom to choose the things that you call us to choose, to raise our sails expectantly for the God of peace to come and fill us. Lord, amaze us this week with the deep peace that we feel, that, that transcends understanding, that's too good to be explained. And help us, Lord, to go out and to spread that peace around. In the name of Christ, our Prince of Peace, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.